Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Michael Dinerstein, who is Assistant Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago. His research interests include public economics with an emphasis on education and industrial organization. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So uh, I want to start with one of your older papers, um, 2014. It's entitled Quantifying the Supply Response of Private Schools uh, to Public Policies. Uh, you say in this paper, public school policies that cause a large demand shift between public and private schooling may cause some private schools to enter or exit the market. This private school supply response further alters students' choices and likely amplifies the policy's effect. Thus, the policy effects under a fixed versus a changing market structure may be very different. So that that uh, that sounds very intuitive, uh, Michael. Um, so so you have a sort of a market um, a test here uh, using New York uh, New York City data. That's right. So. Um... I think we think of education policy often in isolation as focused on one sector or another. Um, and so we have a bunch of education you know, policy making all across the country um, and the world. And, but New York City is a particular, um, particularly active, I would say, uh, well, it's the biggest school district in the US and also they're, they're often changing their policies. And so um, I focused on one of the bigger changes that they've made. This was during uh, Michael Bloomberg's mayoral administration, uh, and it was a school funding reform that basically changed how much funding different public schools were receiving, and then looked at the overflow effects onto not just, you know, the public system, but also the private sector. Yeah. And, and so, so, so one assumption here is that the products of private schools um, uh, let me make a statement, correct me if I'm wrong. The products of pri private schools are significantly different from the products of public schools? Yes. Um, so I would say that's a, you know, a, perhaps an overgeneralization, but I would say for most, most private schools, they, they are pretty differentiated from public schools. You know, the, the primary part being the religious instruction. Um, and oh, so right. over 90, well, Nationally, over 90% and in New York City, a little bit lower, but still over 80% of schools have a religious focus. Right. Okay. And, and so, so what you're saying here is that if you have a policy goes into effect, uh, it has a lot of, lot of different effects. Um, obviously, the private schools are going to, going to make some strategic uh, decisions whether to enter or exit the market. But students also look at uh, look at these things and change their preferences, uh, and so so you have a very dynamic sort of a market structure change. Is that what's happening? Yeah, I would say uh, I think of the students' preferences as being, you know, roughly fixed, um, and that the big change is that their set of options um, responds to the new market structure or to the new policy, and so. Um, you know, I may 
as a student, I may have certain schools. I may know how much I would like or dislike Catholic education. If I went to a private school, I might have a sense of how much I like a public school. Um, and then the big change we're looking at, I guess, in terms of preferences would be the public school funding changes the schools that actually the funding arrives at. And so that school may spend more money on teachers, might expand its extracurricular activities, have more after school programming and so forth. And that's really the direct focus of the, of the policy. And uh, we think of that as really the only change to, um, I'd say, students' valuations of different schools. Um, but then once that comes in, it just induces students to choose new schools in a way that that changes uh, the market structure in terms of which schools can survive. Hmm. You say here, um, we find that while the reform, this is Bloomberg's reform in New York City uh, schools, uh, improved school quality at the public schools and received additional funding, the sorting of some students from private to public schools led them to lower quality schools. And you say the sorting undid much of the reform's positive, positive achievement effect. Um, so this is, a, this is a real complication. <laughs> you know, you, you have a policy that appears to be, at least on the surface, makes a lot of sense, but the net effect of that is very ambiguous. That's right. And I think there are, you know, multiple ways we can think about um, what's a good metric for thinking about success here. Um, we often turn to academic achievement as measured by test scores uh, in, the, in the economics of education. Um, and so here you see there's potentially some trade-off, right? Like the, the public school funding actually, we find it increases the test scores at the schools it goes to, which that on its own is you know, not, not um, it's the source of some contention in the academic literature. It's not clear that additional funding you know, affects test scores. So that's kind of a positive story in terms of the power of this funding. Um, but then you induce this, this sorting of students or, or change in their sorting across sectors that, that potentially leads some students who are at higher achieving schools to lower achieving options. Now, those students, though, are affected beyond just their achievement. Many of them no longer pay for the private education. And so yeah. you could also think of, you know, we call them like welfare metrics or something that incorporates the, the price. And in that sense, a lot of these students might be taking a reduction in school quality, but paying much less. Yeah, but uh, if you sort of look at the net present value of the education investment, uh, that's a very, very long horizon investment. So any, any lower quality, um, any change in quality, I should say, uh, to the negative side, um, I would imagine has negative, uh, significant negative loss in, in uh, value to the student. Right. You could think that, um, you know, decisions about where to send my kid to school might be overly focused on the present. It's often the parent making the choice as well. You know, so it could be, I don't really want to have to have my kid travel across town to this other school. And so it may come at the expense of the, the, the students, you know, future academic outcomes and future earnings. And so even just, even if the price component is a big deal, it's, you know, there's this tension between who's actually paying and who's benefiting from the education itself. And we don't really explore this uh, intra-household or intra-family dynamic, but I think it's a very important one in terms of how we, how we think about these results. Yeah, and, and of course, I know that you have done a lot of work in this area. You know, one macro question is, why why does that quality differential exist between public schools and private schools? And uh, you know, is it is it the structure? Is it the teacher uh, quality? I don't know what the what they are, uh, but you have to you have to look at why that quality differential exists, right? That's right, and you're right. That's a you know a big and a, and really hard question. Um, and it's really a differential on average. You know, there are plenty, first off, measurement is hard here, especially in the US because private schools rarely participate in public testing or at least even public reporting of their test results. And beyond that, even just having test results, we don't necessarily assume that's the equivalent of quality. Even if we agree that test scores are good measures, we could have um, just sorting of, you know, students who are going to do well no matter where they go they could end up in certain private schools and, and we wouldn't necessarily want to call that the private school quality 
but more they just attracted different types of students. So in general, it's just a really hard measurement problem. Um, and in, there's kind of new evidence, not from me, but from other researchers, where there, it's unclear that um, in, maybe not New York City, but in context outside of New York City, that private schools do have um, a, po a, a, different, a positive difference on average. But to the extent that it does exist, yeah, I don't think we have a great idea of why. Um, and there are plenty of schools, even in the same market, that, that are on the lower quality side. Um, it could be more efficient spending of resources. Uh, it could be better peers. Um, it could, you know, at, there, as an economist, I'd probably make sure to mention that there could be some sort of, you know, profit motive. Now, these aren't usually for-profit schools, but there might be some similar like incentives. And I, I don't think we have, too, we, don't, we don't know too much there. We might even know more outside the U.S. in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking back. Uh, I grew up in South India and, um, you know, a uh, long time ago, uh, you know, thinking back to primary school, high school education, uh, it was sort of, a, I would say, 90 to 10 percent split, 90 percent public, 10 percent private. So the the availability of private schools uh, it were, were very scarce. So essentially your decision um you know, largely uh, it depends on wealth. Uh, it depends on, you know, those types of attributes ultimately, uh, not not quality. Uh, and so, so you have to wonder, you know, the teacher to student ratio, you know, things like that. Do they substantially differ between private and public schools in the U.S.? Uh, yes, uh, it depends on the school, but public schools tend to be quite a bit bigger. Um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I would expect there's on the order about a five, uh, on average, a difference in that ratio, about five students per teacher. Um, so that could be part of it. I, I don't, and lots of other, there are lots of other differences and we call like educational inputs. Um, typically private schools pay their teachers less. So their teachers tend to be less credentialed and have, uh, fewer of them have master's degrees, although it's unclear whether, whether those actually affect teacher quality directly. Um, so we do see some differences in inputs across these schools. And, and as you said, you know, the, the types of students who are attending these schools are very different and income is, is really the, the leading candidate there. Yeah, and other complication, I don't know, I don't know anything, uh, anything about this, Michael. So you, you mentioned sort of religious denominations um, and things like that in private school. Um, do they actually interfere with the content of education in any way in the U.S.? It's probably dependent on the exact denomination. Um, yeah. So my focus has been on urban education um, in the U.S. And there, the uh, dominant uh, religion among private schools is Catholicism, Roman Catholicism. And right those schools tended to have more of a religious focus in like the 1970s. And as demographics changed and a lot of um, Catholics left the cities, they transitioned to educating more non-Catholic students. Although they're still, obviously they were, they had Catholic instruction, but um, my understanding is that the, uh, the religious part and the academic instruction um, I, I were somewhat complementary, but weren't, um, they, you could not necessarily, you could, for instance, forego some of the religious instruction. Um, for other schools, especially in New York City, you have a large number of Jewish schools, Orthodox Jewish, you have some conservative Christian schools. And my understanding is for those schools, they are much more tied to, so the religious instruction is more of the focus. Um, there's, of course, academic instruction as well, but um, families don't necessarily report choosing those schools because of the academic quality. The religious part is really the, the first part. So I'm not sure it would necessarily interfere, but I can imagine many people are asking for more religious instruction at those schools um, and perhaps less time on more standard academic subjects. Yeah, uh, Michael, I was also wondering if there is a sort of long horizon longitudinal data. Test scores are one thing, but the, the more uh, important question would be sort of a, a success in life metric. Um, is there any data that, that shows a significant difference between the two cohorts? 
Off the top of my head, I can't think of data in the US on private schools that establishes that link. Um, yeah. It may exist, but I'm not off the top of my head. Um, we, we definitely have it for charter schools and public schools. Yeah. And then outside the US, we, we have it for private schools as well. Typically here, the longer run outcome is um, first often something related to higher education. So um, do you go to university? Which university do you go to? Um, and then a, a small, and, and sometimes also um, other outcomes such as uh, arrests or um, yeah. so forth. Um, and then there are some papers that have earnings as an outcome. Um, there are not many of them, though typically they have found that test score, um, that schools or interventions that have test score effects also have effects on earnings. Often they have to wait for quite a while to see earnings, especially because for some students, the early 20s is not the best time to measure earnings because say they went to graduate school, so they're earning nothing, but you'd say their earning potential is very high. Um, and so we're, um, as, as we get, uh, as we just progress in time and we have more data that we've collected over the years, I expect um, probably we'll have more evidence soon on the relationship between test scores and earnings or treatment effects on test scores and treatment effects on earnings, even for the private sector in the US. Yeah, I remember seeing something about, um, you know, things like SAT not having very high correlation to academic success and even things like GRE and GMAT, even graduate schools, um, that data might be available more readily. Right. right. Often it, it's, it's kind of like a, we need a combination of things. So we need data that's available uh, with some sort of variation in an intervention at an earlier moment in time. So there's, um, you know, cross-sectionally, there's a strong correlation between test scores and other outcomes in life. But we wouldn't necessarily attribute that to anything about the educational system, necessarily. Um, and then it also, um, the, the further on you get, I mean, so in the US, grades three through eight, students in the same state are basically all taking the same tests. Even as you get to high school, but especially beyond high school, um, we often will have these types of outcomes, but only for a subset of students. So for instance, the GMAT. Um, we would have for students interested in business school. And there might be lots of you know, educational interventions that are just not targeted towards students who are ever gonna, or who, are, who, who targeted towards student populations that send a lot of students to business school. And so um, it, I think there's some work that, that suggests that perhaps the, for instance, effect of going to an elite university is not that big relative to a different elite university, whereas the effects at, um, at uh, lower levels in higher education might be very big. And so kind of we have to almost align the outcome with, with the variation that we're using. And, and it's um, fewer of those examples come, come to fruition than you might think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it could be also self-fulfilling uh, type of situation if, if universities use test scores for admission criteria and um, and so you know it, it sort you will get good effects, um, but it, it is quite possible that uh, it's not driven by test scores; it's just driven by the fact that you are in that university. That's right, and you know the whole the fact that these um, allocations or uh, decisions of where students go to school are dependent on the measure itself, you know, can interact or interfere. It's kind of like the old saying that um, among you know extremely good basketball players, height is not correlated with success, but we know height matters. It's just everyone who is in the NBA is already very tall. Right, right, yeah. So, so returning to the paper, do you have, uh, you say policy effects under a fixed versus a changing market structure may be very different. Do you have some policy prescriptions? Yes, um, and it's definitely this is the focus of some ongoing work, and we didn't, you know, in that in that analysis, um, get to explore much beyond speculation. And, and I hope to have more work soon that does that. Um, we, uh, you know, it, there's a room for perhaps targeting these types of public policy interventions uh, based on the types of private schools that exist. So. Um, 
my impression is that in most cases, the private sector is not considered when, when constructing um, public school education policy. And so if there is an area where you have a bunch of private schools that uh, it's perhaps a very dense area of New York City, really high cost to having a building, um, you know, you might, uh, you might uh, pull back on the policy a little bit to let those private schools survive. Of course, you know, even that is, is making some students winners and some students losers from a policy. So it's not, um, you know, it may do better in aggregate, but some students uh, would be worse off um, than a version that kind of ignored the private sector. This, you could also have, um, you know, commensurate uh, public investment in private schools when there is, say, a public policy that gives out more public school funding. Uh, it could also make grants to private schools at the same time, especially grants um, that are focused on covering fixed costs, because we find that we, we find that that's really the driver of why these schools are shutting down. Now, the more assistance you give to the private sector might keep those schools open. And, and the point of, of that paper that we're talking about is that keeping them open benefits a lot of students. Um, but what we didn't really explore in the paper, but I think is relevant to thinking about policy is what sort of incentives it gives the private sector, right? So one reason you might um, give out public school funding, for instance, is uh, not to necessarily shut down the private sector, but to make them compete harder and they might even improve. And so we didn't really focus on that on the in the paper, but even kind of policy prescriptions like um, uh, private school assistance, it's not clear how much of it you'd want. You kind of want to preserve some of the competitive components without actually crowding out the private schools. Yeah, so it's a very complex question. You have a, a recent paper that's sort of related the equilibrium effects of public provision in education markets, evidence from a public school expansion policy. Uh, in this paper, you say in markets with private options, the optimal level of public provision may require balancing a trade-off between reducing private options market power with the possibility of crowding out uh, potentially high quality products. These considerations are particularly relevant in many developing countries' education systems where state capacity is increasing, but low levels of past public provision mean many private schools already exist. So, so multiple problems here that one is sort of the initial conditions that one has to take into account when you think about a policy. And the other is, uh, you're talking about here some sort of an optimization, that there's a trade-off um, between, uh, between market power and, and, and the quality of products. Um, but that, uh, that optimization sounds to me, Michael, that you have to really consider what the sort of the initial conditions are uh, to get to optimality there. Uh, you, you have a case here from the Dominican That's Republic? Correct. You want to talk sure. about um, yeah. it? Sure. Your point about initial conditions is, is right on. Um, and I think they might be particularly relevant in developing countries like the Dominican Republic. Uh, so, so in this country, in, um, in 2012, they had um, some low test scores on international tests and they also had a lot of overcrowding in their public system. So um, they would have students in schools, for, in schools for just a few hours a day because they had to reuse the rooms for more students. Um, so that might, you know, it, it, it's sensible to think that uh, as the country develops, as there's more tax revenue, as the country has, say, the capacity to invest in more public infrastructure and public services, that they should expand the public sector. Um, and I think that's you know a very reasonable uh, intuition. Um, now, because the system in 2012 had been a bit overtaxed, the public system, I mean, sorry, not taxed in terms of taxation, but it was stretched thin, um, a lot of private options existed. Uh, and these are options that gave students longer school days, that had cleaner bathrooms, that gave them more instruction. And so we think of that as kind of the initial condition due to maybe past low investments in the public system you already have a bunch of private options available. And that initial condition matters because a lot of these schools have already incurred the costs to open. So there might be a situation where we say, we don't, you know, if we could have rewound 10 years, we don't need this private school to be here. We could have a public school, students might like it more, pay less or something like that. But once the private schools open, it exists, they've already incurred a bunch of costs. 
And so um, I think what your point about initial conditions is exactly right. And so we are evaluating a public school expansion policy in the Dominican Republic that started in 2012. And they nearly, um, nearly doubled the, the capacity of the public system. Uh, and so this is uh, a somewhat rare ex a chance to study what happens when there's such a big change in the public sector and the size of it. Um, but it's really um, anchored in what the situation was prior to that. And that's a, a you know, system without much public provision, lots of private options. Um, and so that's kind of the, the starting point for why we thought it was an interesting place to study the question of just how much public provision should you have in general, but also taking very seriously the fact that these private options already exist. And so that's kind of part of the, of the policy making process. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, sort of related to the, the point we were discussing before. It, um, in, you know, it, it seems to me that uh, policy makers are not really thinking about return to society. So there, there is a resource constraint. There is not infinite resources for anybody. So there is, there is a pot of money, a pot of resources, and it is truly an allocation problem uh, for, the, uh, for the policy maker. And the policy maker has to optimize that constrained resource given multiple products already existing in the market. Uh, and that is what is not typically done, I think, in, in, in policy making in developing countries. Right. I, you know, at least for the Dominican Republic, I can speak to um, our understanding is that the, um, the way they decided, they, made, they solved this allocation problem is they didn't consider the private sector. And so you might imagine that yeah. um, if there are a few private schools already out there and, you know, those schools, uh, people are paying for them then you know, the tuition dollars, or, or you know, in Dominican Republic, different currency, but the tuition funding is adding more money to the system. And so in some ways, it's kind of making the, the, the resource constraint bind less. But as you, you solve the allocation problem differently, and you put a new public school nearby, it might not just you know, shut down the private school, but all of a sudden you have um, families, for instance, paying less um, from their own pockets for education and thus entering the public system for which the public system has to pay for them. Now, of course, there are lots of distributional consequences and then, you know, we don't necessarily think it's always better to have, to have families being forced to pay for education and you know, especially when there are different abilities to pay. Um, but certainly, you know, when you start to think of a subsidized sector like the public sector and a, it not subsidized sector in the Dominican Republic, the private sector, um, then you know the resource constraint for this allocation problem is changing with the allocation itself. Right, right. The, yeah, the constraint is changing, and it is a complex problem because one can get a clean metric, such as a return to society type metric, and so a policy maker. Um, I mean, you cannot. It, it's difficult to challenge the policy makers' options. Uh, because I would imagine to prove otherwise will require significant uh, significant effort. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very sympathetic to how complex this problem is for policymakers. I think it's you know, arguably a, a fairly easy criticism to say you didn't consider the private sector. No, I think our work is hoping to convince policymakers they should they should try to consider it, but to you know, I think some steps are, would be very valuable at solving kind of solving a full optimization problem with kind of a lot of precision is, you know, uh, I think a goal, but it's a very challenging one. And even as researchers with lots of computational resources and, and honestly, the ability to make certain assumptions in our analysis, we find it very hard as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm of the belief, Michael, that the, these policy choices are really difficult uh, both analytically as well as, um, you know, all the factors involved, the complexity of it. Um, it, it is increasingly the case, in my view, that policy makers have to have uh, a level of education, a, a background, expertise, experience, uh, to actually make these policy choices. But, but the, the political system is not really set up like that. Uh, often 
uh, that the people who end up making these policy choices don't really have a good background. Right, or the political system is, you know, combining lots of people's interests, maybe for good reason, uh, but it's putting constraints. And so, um, you know, it's not quite as simple as having one person go into a room and figure it out, um, even regardless of how, you know, uh, educated or the tools at this person's disposal. It's a balancing lots of interests. And, um, you know, for our purposes as researchers, we this often leads to um, random or odd policy choices uh, that help us study things because the randomness is very helpful, but, but of course um, doesn't usually reflect what, kind of what we'd call the optimal version. Right, right. We'll take a quick break, Michael. When we come back, we'll talk about some of your recent papers. Great. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we're back, uh, Michael. We were talking about uh, schools, uh, public and private schools, and policy uh, choices in, in, uh, in public provision of education. Um, I want to go into a, a totally different topic, uh, for one of your papers from 2017, Consumer Price Search and Platform Design in Internet Commerce. Uh, you say the platform design, the process that helps potential buyers on the internet navigate toward products they may purchase, plays a critical role in reducing search frictions and determining market outcomes. And you study here a trade-off associated with two important roles of efficient platform design, guiding consumers to their most desired product while also strengthening seller incentives to lower prices. Um, uh, I, I, I was looking at uh, some of the things that this uh, internet uh, retailers are doing, Michael, and um, we, we have a platform. I know that paper from 2017, things are changing quite dramatically, as you know, um, to the extent that artificial intelligence could be applied to predict consumer needs, uh, certain retailers are going in the direction that uh, they don't require a consumer to, to go make a purchase choice. They're going to just uh, drop the package on your door when, <laughs> when <laughs> you're, you're going to get. So that is, that is uh, you know, reducing search cost to zero. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, that, that is probably a way to the future. Uh, but there is a trade-off here, right? So that the time... Uh, a consumer needs to spend to get to the right product um, and uh, and the seller incentives at lower prices. So how do these two things interact in the, in the status quo? Sure. So, you know, it's dependent on the platform. The work we're talking about was um, the empirical setting was eBay. Um, a lot of these platforms, though, uh, develop their own internal algorithms, um, often using machine learning or other techniques to basically predict what an individual who arrives at the site might want to buy. And, you know, at, in the extreme, as you mentioned, it might eventually become, it just is dropped off for you and you don't even have to announce that you're buying it. Yeah. Um, and so this prediction process, uh, you know, is, there are lots of computer scientists and, and people at these companies who work on it. Um, and so they're trying to, in some ways, make it as simple as possible for someone to find what they want, uh, reduce the search time almost to zero. Um, yeah. The idea that the search time is either costly, you don't want to spend time searching, or it will just lead you to things that you don't want. You never find the thing that you do want. Um, and our take is that that's, um, and that's mostly the status quo. Um, not everywhere, but mostly. And so our take is that you might... Um, you might change this process a little bit. Um, and these are often hidden in, say, the non-default options on site. Uh, if you think of, say, sorting by price, uh, which results on and so forth, um, you may care about more than price, especially on eBay. Some of the low-priced items are not exactly what you would want. They may be 
it's yeah. more damaged. Um, but as long as you find search to be difficult, the platform has this kind of choice of, should we sort of do all of the search for you to the extent we can make a good prediction and give you what we think you want? Mm -hmm. Or should we just obey a real simple rule, say sort based on price, which doesn't always get you what you want, yeah. but puts a lot of pressure on the other side of the market. And so now we have the people trying to sell things. These might be big companies, they might be individuals who are posting products to be sold on these sites. And uh, they are trying to uh, get consumers to find them. But if the algorithm is going to frequently deliver their product into onto the web page for the, the person searching, then this winds up generating a lot of market power for these, these options. And so they can potentially charge higher prices. So there might be cases, and we, we kind of quantify a case, uh, where the platform might actually not say give the most accurate prediction in terms of, or not show the most accurate prediction in terms of what the person wants to buy, but give them something slightly different in order to force the other side of the market to compete more. Mm -hmm. And this competition eventually actually makes the products in general that are available better. And so um, there's kind of trade-off and then that's what we explore in the paper. Yeah, so from a platform uh, provider's perspective though, Michael, yeah, as long as a transaction happens, they're happy, right? Um, you know, I think it, it's, I, I no. think that's a good approximation. I think, you know, they'd like higher price transactions, but in general, I think um, yeah. having more transactions is roughly how they think about things. Yeah, so, so I was wondering, what is the incentive for the platform provider to make the transaction efficient? Uh, I understand that they, they, they would like to maximize the transaction value uh, and that has a clear implication for their profits, but, but do they really have an incentive to make the transaction more efficient? Um, if the transaction is more efficient, uh, I guess presumably there will be more transactions, but I don't know if that has been shown. Yeah, that's right. I mean, even in the kind of simple example I mentioned, uh, when the sellers compete harder on price and this leads to a lower transaction price typically the platform's profits go down as well so it's not obvious that the platform's you know thrilled with this outcome um i think it's probably platform specific the way we think about it, it's a bit for a given platform are they finding it harder to attract buyers or sellers to their platform a lot of these platforms really rely on network economics or kind of density so if you're in a situation where you already have lots of people selling things on your platform, right. but you uh, are competing with other platforms to get buyers, yeah. then this could be a case where any individual transaction is, say, more efficient or at a lower price. But the key is you're basically getting more people to your platform at, and not to competing platforms. If you had a different situation where you were competing harder to get sellers to your platform, you might come down a very different side of this trade-off. That's right. Yeah. So, so long term, um, by by making the transactions more efficient, there might be a tactical loss, but uh, but they will they will more than make that up through uh, a larger number of people using the platform uh, for a longer period of time. Right. Um, and you know, I think pr my sense is that platforms uh, differ in terms of how they think about this. And even a single platform probably changes every few years in terms of which side of the market it's it's most most focused on, how, how it thinks short term outcomes translate into long term. But, but that's that's indeed how we think about it. Yeah, and I, you know, I I, I was wondering, Michael, that um, the platform has a lot more information than a typical buyer. And so the algorithms that they have built are likely better to make a cost quality trade-off than the consumer herself. Um, if, that is, if that is the case, I wonder if there is, you know, a consumer might even pay for that, right, in some way? Absolutely. Um, the, uh, so, so you're right that the platforms often have um, you know, they have lots of resources behind making this prediction, but they just have so much data from other people's purchases. And so yeah. it's much easier for them to identify, say, fraudulent products or in, a, in the extreme or, or a whole bunch of things. Um, and, uh, and so uh, uh, they're, 
a lot of these platforms are subject to um, challenges like preventing gaming or, or things that basically flood their markets with low quality products. Um, and so, you know, they spend a, a lot of time figuring out what the best thing might be for a consumer. And, you know, from a consumer's perspective, um, if you're aware of this, then you can save a lot of time on search. Um, if you, you know, if that's time saved that you value, or you can kind of customize your search, but with the knowledge of, of that you're being delivered results that have fairly high reliability, you know, that can be worth a lot, especially for high val or high transaction price objects. Uh, the cost to getting something low quality could be really high. So I think there's, there's definitely some segmentation in the market in platforms that specialize on better filtering of quality. Yeah, yeah. And um, I don't know if eBay does this or other uh, internet commerce companies, uh, but there are, there are clearly customer ratings there, uh, customer feedbacks. Uh, presumably the platform could have a rating and feedback as well, right? I don't know if that exists. Oh, you mean like consumers or someone rating different platforms? Uh, no, I mean somebody at the platform provider. I see. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's challenging. I think, you know, I'm speculating here, but I imagine that they, um, you know, discretion to to provide their own ratings might be very valuable. And also there's probably some value in uh, having transparent rules just to yeah. attract people to the platform. Um, and so, you know, I, eBay, for instance, uh, has various, not the most, has versions of this, like they'll have best rated seller. And this is a designation and you get a, a, a symbol near your name. Um, and that's you know, a, a, a function of just only a few things. And so I think there's a huge premium there on them just being transparent. So they want something in order to do what you're saying uh, and not just rely on customer ratings, um, although customer ratings are often a part of this. Um, but I think they're a little bit, I would suspect they're a little bit nervous about getting too fine tuned with this uh, in terms of lack of transparency. Yeah, yeah. Like you mentioned, you know, um, yeah, on eBay, for instance, you can sort it using uh, price. Uh, but if you're searching for a specific product, um, sometimes lower prices are for products, uh, it, it, totally different products, right? Uh, and, and you, you have to scan through multiple pages before you get to the, the functionality that you're looking for. Uh, and so right now it seems like, you know, just a table that, uh, that is being sorted. <laughs> That's right. Um, and, and this, so the success of the various site or the way in the various trade-offs that we've discussed kind of are so dependent on the platform's ability to filter in the first place. And so the example we saw frequently was, um, iPhones. And so, uh, if you can't filter iPhone well, uh, on eBay, for instance, if you were to sort by lowest price, you'd get all of the iPhone cases. And there's so many cases you would be searching for a long time and you'd redo the search or something uh, to get to the phones. And so um, that kind of, um, in the literature, some people call it obfuscation, um, can certainly yeah. kind of in interfere to the point where it's really the first order thing here is can you filter listings? Like all of this stuff about should you sort or fine tuning the exact sorting process is a bit secondary. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so, so really sort of getting that intelligence more, just doing that would substantially reduce search costs for consumers. That's right. And, and I think they probably monitor the, um, you know, if you are selling an iPhone case, you have a high incentive to figure out how to get it listed with iPhones. And so <laughs> it's, I, I think it's a give and take. And, and so setting transparent rules, but being constantly aware of of how people are um, maybe go, trying to go yeah. around them. Yeah, I have to say, Michael, I'm increasingly attracted to this idea that some retailer is going to just send me what I need <laughs> rather than you know, going and looking for it. Um, I, I just want to go to another a recent paper on a different subject, uh, competition and entry in agricultural markets, experimental evidence from Kenya. Um, African agricultural markets, you say, are characterized by low farmer revenues and high consumer food prices. I Many have worried that this wedge is partially driven by imperfect competition among intermediaries. 
uh, intermediaries are a, a big problem in in many markets uh, in the developing world, and this is this is sort of a, a classical example of that, right? Yes. Um, so this this work with Lauren Bergquist at, at Michigan, we're you know I think intermediaries are uh, in lots of these markets, but because there's potentially not very developed infrastructure and so forth, there's kind of a clear reason why intermediaries might exist, um, you know, moving product across the country. And so I, I think, you know, on, on its face, these intermediaries could be providing a really good service. I mean, they, they probably are, but um, I, I think the competition component, the, the degree to which they're not competing has not received much focus until lately. And so it is really sort of collusion. Is that the issue? Uh, this is our conclusion. Um, collusion is a, you know, we don't, it's not a case where we have um, the uh, internal company documents you sometimes find in, say, antitrust cases that are just kind of clear evidence of collusion. They're announcing that they're colluding. And so instead, we rely on observing market outcomes and how they vary with different um, experimental treatments that we ourselves introduce and understand do change it, do basically responses to say a cost shock. Uh, do they look like uh, what would happen under perfect competition, under different degrees of competition, uh, or is it more like collusion? And so we basically use these, this variation that we introduce to the market, see how people respond. And uh, our findings are that it's very consistent with, with collusion. Now, whether, and, and there's also a lot of circumstantial evidence from, say, surveys that uh, intermediaries here do know each other, do often discuss prices. So there are lots of components you'd usually associate with collusion that make it, that kind of uh, offer supporting evidence that our statistical analysis seems to be picking something up. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's striking that you say we estimate that traders capture 82% of the total surplus. Um, and, and so both the consumer and the producer come out empty <laughs> in this case. Right. So this calculation, we, we don't see too much about the producer, say the farmer. And so um, yeah. here we're basically saying all the surplus that's created from the moment this farmer sells, right after the farmer sells to the intermediary. And so, but you're right, the, the final consumers don't get that much surplus. So they're buying at prices that are not too far away from their, the max they would pay, the maximum. Um, and so this is capturing a lot of surplus. Um, that said, the, if you were to just choose a random trader intermediary in this environment, many of them are not making much um, money. Hmm. It's really these big ones that have, um, you know, big warehouses that have uh, some trucks that they can transport things in. And they're able to sell a lot at pretty high prices. And they're, so they're really, um, th they wind up capturing most of the surplus. Yeah, so, so there are some entry barriers here. These, so these are not really contested markets then, right? Um, so, so when you have those two, three uh, big guys, uh, they are ma ma basically making any other entry difficult? That's our impression. We, um, so in terms of uh, what the traders discuss and report, um, there's some capital costs necessary to enter different markets. Uh, you need to transport things. So often certain markets will be fairly easy for you as a trader to enter because your storage facility is close by. Um, you might have some local knowledge of the market. But to enter a new market not too much further away might be a big challenge. And so you're not necessarily contesting the market over there. Uh, and so that makes it clear they kind of segment the, the set of markets in a way that they're not, no individual market is, is contested that much. And so we see even among people who have already decided to become a trader and often do have some of the capital necessary to, to trade, they don't, they're, uh, it's pretty rare that they enter new markets um, further away in the county. And so this kind of means that you have roughly, you know, three to five traders at every market. Uh, and rarely do you get additional ones. And even when we gave them pretty generous subsidies to go enter a new market, the take up of that subsidy was not not too high. Hmm. So, so sort of geographical specialization and other factors prevent uh, entry. Um, are, are there are there policies uh, you can think of that 
that might um, dampen this issue. Right. And, and another factor of, you know, when it's geographic, it's also often when the entrants do actually show up in the cases where they do, um, the incumbents compete pretty hard that day. And so they basically make it not very attractive that day. Um, and so we were, uh, it, it's a somewhat pessimistic finding on the, the potential for entry um, to solve the problems here. I also think the institutions in Kenya and a lot of these countries, it's, they're not set up to necessarily have, say, antitrust investigations that you would have elsewhere. So that's not obviously the answer either. Um, we speculated at the end of the paper that maybe, um, actually relating to maybe the previous paper we talked about, uh, is some sort of platform that can potentially pool information might uh, maybe provide some price transparency uh, and make the entry decision a little bit less subject to uncertainty about what price you might get. And so I'm not sure this is kind of a magic bullet that will solve everything, um, but there might be reasons to think that one could facilitate better entry with say better information. Could also, if consumers are able to choose which market to, to go buy at, which there's a geographic component that makes that a, you know not the easiest substitution, but that can you know, price transparency could also mean that even though you only have three or four traders per market, if I'm choosing between two markets, I kind of have now eight I could potentially buy from, and at that point, you know now I might have enough eight traders. They might start to compete with each other, or they might not know each other, and so they might not collude. Right. Yeah. But to the extent that there is no antitrust. Um, sort of um, enforcement, it, it will always degrade into some sort of a collusion over time because it's very profitable uh, for the intermediary to do so. Uh, I was also wondering why, I know these markets are small, but why are the very successful internet commerce platforms not entering these markets? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I can speculate. I'm not not too sure. Um, sometimes, you know, small markets that are in remote areas, uh, it's hard to scale up the internet platform in a way. Kind of, they have to get to every market. They have to get the participation of um, whichever government official is running the market, if there is one. Uh, and so, <clears throat> the remoteness and the smallness um, actually make it quite difficult for the platforms to penetrate uh, as because a lot of this is they actually the platforms have to actually arrive and get agreement among the various parties so it'd almost be easier if there were only a few very big markets because then you could focus on getting those to agree or you know introducing the platform there um, so that's my impression kind of like fixed costs associated with um, introducing a platform like this to every subsequent market i would imagine the government might be able to play some sort of role that could that could alleviate some of these fixed costs, but I don't know too much about, for instance, how much the Kenyan government has thought about this. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, if, the, if that fixed cost is high, you won't get entry. So it seems like the problem, uh, the solution to the problem is really back, uh, back to the government, right? That's probably the only way to break the shackles. Yeah, um, you know, it's... I, but even among government policies, you could, you know, um, we thought maybe entry subsidies. So the government could offer entry subsidies that um, that could be some component of it. That didn't seem that well. We offered them, but it doesn't seem obvious that a government version of that would work any better. Um, I think antitrust policy is a little bit off the table uh, at this point, at least. Um, and so maybe something in between. Um, but I do think you're right that um, it's it's kind of asking for a sort of big and coordinated type intervention. And, and so that, you know, that might take the place in terms of government inter intervention. Do we have any examples? So suppose the Kenyan government creates sort of an electronic platform for trading uh, and they take, you know, sort of a platform investment and then both sellers and buyers can go onto that platform uh, to actually make the transaction happen. Do we have any evidence, any, any example of this happening in, um, in developing yes. countries? Yes, so um, several countries have, have moved in this direction. Um, India actually has a platform called Enom, which um, you know, you can, you know, you're probably more familiar with it than I am, but it's, uh, it, it's, it accounts for a large fraction of the world's agriculture. And so Enom is being introduced 
in India uh, in a staggered fashion. So it's not everywhere, but lots of states, uh, pretty much all states or, um, or territories now have at least some of their markets on Enom. And a few have now actually all of their markets are on Enom. And so this is a system where it used to be that, so this is for farmers and traders rather than traders and final consumers, but I think that the insights are pretty similar. Um, so they would go, they used to go to the market and kind of make bilateral deals. So you talk to someone, you might know them, and then you make a deal, and then they go and sell your your uh, crop to someone else, and they eventually give you uh, give you the money later once they receive it from downstream. Uh, and so the Indian government here has introduced a platform which does a number of things at once. It uh, measures quality directly. So it has, um, it tries to quantify quality in terms of say moisture content of the crop and so forth. Uh, it then runs an auction where people can bid and they don't actually have to be present to bid. They could do it over their phone from a different location. Uh, and then um, it's kind of, the, the product is delivered right there. So there are a whole bunch of things happening at once. And then they're, you know, that's not the only part of this. They're also trying to ease um, rules on who's allowed to be a trader at different sites and cross state lines. Um, it's still pretty early. So they're only, I think, uh, you know, three or four years into this. There are some early uh, state specific pilots that have seemed to perhaps lowered prices, uh, sorry, raised prices. So farmers are receiving higher prices than they did before. Um, but I think it's still kind of enough that uh, uh, very interested in trying to study study what will happen. Yeah, yeah. At, at least at, um, from an intuitive sense, uh, it makes a lot of sense. So um, I wondered, you know, uh, if I mean, a lot of these countries have the same problem. These developing countries. Um, I, I wondered if there's some sort of United Nations type organization who can help, you know, sort of jumpstart something like this, um, you would probably get, you know, sort of faster implementation. Um, I don't know if there's any organization. I mean, it doesn't require that much of an investment, right? Even foundations could could potentially think about this. Right. Um, I, I think those are, that's an excellent point. Um, I'm struck just by when I talk to government officials in say India or other countries, um, how aware of and interested they are in other countries' experiences. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I think we don't always get as much of that in the U.S. I mean, it's a, the U.S. is a big country, <laughs> of course. but um, And so I think there's certainly um, the uh, willingness and desire to kind of learn from others' experiences. Uh, but I think you're right that even beyond just like borrowing best practices, some sort of international coordination could have a lot of benefits. Yeah, yeah. So I want to finish up with your uh, most recent paper, Michael, Human Capital Depreciation. Um, human capital, you say, can depreciate if skills are unused. Uh, but estimating human capital depreciation is challenging as worker skills are difficult to measure and less productive workers are more likely to spend time in non-employment. Um, again, makes a lot of intuitive sense. I would imagine this depreciation is accelerating for, for human capital as required skills in the economy are changing dramatically. Uh, but uh, you have a case here from Greece and uh, trying to get to some, some numbers, uh, perhaps. Uh, you want to talk a bit sure. about so, that? Sure, um, so you can imagine that say, um, your skills become less valuable over time if not used either because um, atrophy or something like that or obsolescence. Uh, which, yeah. you know, is the, you, you had skills designed for um, the way things were done at some point and then they changed the technology on you and you don't know the new te technology. Um, so I think both of those are relevant for human capital depreciation. Our setting is going to be more focused on atrophy. So we wind up looking at the education system again, and this is, and teachers. Yeah. And these are teachers for whom um, they graduate with degrees, university degrees, and then um, they often have to wait a while until they're in front of students in a classroom. And while they're waiting, the curriculum is not changing. So they're not, the, so the obsolescence is just winds up not being kind of a component of the setting, but the atrophy is a very, potentially a big component. So these are people who just got their university degree. They're pretty young. 
um, and they're on a career track, but they can't actually get the job for three to four years. And so, um, you know, lot, I, I know like when I was that age, if, if I were told just to wait around for a while, I, it, it could be pretty damaging to remembering what I had learned at, during university or just like the soft skills about you know, showing up on time and so forth. And so, but we're focused on education partly for, for two reasons. One, and you know, obviously as, as this discussion so far has shown, I have just have inherent interest in it. But um, one is that, you know, as you say, this is a very intuitive story. It's almost close to obvious that this could happen, but the measurement challenge is big because rarely can we say this worker has this productivity or this output. You know, people who work in big firms, how you know you see something that was produced at the firm level, you have no, it's really hard to know who did what. Um, often that's proprietary. For in education, the teachers have students and we can link the students to individual teachers. And so we can look at what happens to students' output or test scores. It's you know, a much more direct linkage than usual. And then the other reason we look at education is uh, the institutional details, which I've hinted at, in terms of how teachers get assigned to positions in Greece. And there's this long wait period. This wait period has some components to it that are pretty random. And so we argue that we have kind of sets of otherwise identical teachers, some of whom had to wait, say, three years for their job, some two years. And then we can make pretty simple comparison in terms of, in terms of their students' outcomes between these two groups. And so, so this is a very specific question that skills depreciation related to non-use of skills or delay in the use of skills. That's right? correct. Uh, and so, so more broadly, I, I know that it will be difficult to extrapolate from there, but more, more broadly, Michael, would you say, uh, so the, the, there's obviously that problem, uh, but even if you are employed, uh, I think the chance of underemployment, incorrect employment, um, all of those are actually becoming more critical um, in the skills depreciation, right? If If you... If you're not in a situation that you're constantly upgrading skills, uh, you know you're going to you're going to lose the race. So it's uh, it seems to me that it's not just sitting idle, but it's also sitting. Or it's also doing things that are not not optimum. Do you see it that way? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's you know right even during employment you might. Um, even during a good match for you, like a job that cultivates certain skills, you know, further investment on your own might quite, quite likely pays off. Um, but you're right, like poor matches, or you know, it might be, it might have, might be employment that makes sense. Say um, you have high student loans, and so you need a job that has a high enough salary to pay that off. But it might, you might be sacrificing kind of learning on the job. You take a higher salary position, but one that's not really going to teach you new technologies that will be important for your for your career. Um, so I think that's absolutely right. Um, I'd say uh, non-employment is a little bit of a, uh, a case of some focus just because we do have a lot of policy around, say, unemployment insurance, um, how we should encourage people to look for new jobs. But these, you know, these interact, right? So you could say non-employment can be pretty damaging. So we would love if this person, maybe outside the education profession, but in other settings, could be hired quite soon for a new job. But as you say, like there might be some trade-off. We know their skills are depreciating while they're waiting for any job, but it would be nice if they got into a job that's a good fit for them in lots of ways, but in part due to the skills they would learn on the job. Yeah, so, so this teacher assignment process in Greece, um, you estimate a skill depreciation rate of 4.3% and experience returns of 6.8%. What's experience? Returns? So here we're doing a decomposition that um, essentially we're saying that there are two. So if I don't work for one year, there are kind of two things that happen to me. One is my skills may atrophy. And that's kind of the first number that you mentioned. We would quantify that around 4%. <laughs> But even if I had no atrophy uh, and I just sit around, so I kind of remember everything I used to know, I, I'm still at a disadvantaged position after that year because someone who was working might have been learning on the job. And so I'm missing out on this right. learning or what we call an experience. And that's the part we quantify at 
So kind of we, we argue that both components are quite important. Now, for many people, you get both at once. So if I'm working or I'm not working, I'll get them both or neither. But we might think that some policies might target, might, it, it might matter if it's really the atrophy from sitting around that's the big deal, or it's I just miss out on this great on-the-job learning that I would have had. Yeah, so this is interesting, Michael. So the, the human capital depreciation laws for an economy, uh, you could compute something like that uh, for the pandemic, right? We, you know, we are so, sort of uh, standing still for a period of time in, in almost any, um, uh, any uh, industry. Uh, it should have some negative right. effects. Yeah, right? absolutely. I mean, there's been a ton of policy focus here on the loss in learning for students. But you're right, the people who are adults um, and who are not working, uh, it, it can be a huge loss to the economy. Yeah, now, so, you know, when, when we think about trade-offs in terms of um, incentives to bring the economy back, this component is not really factored in there. And if you measure this, if it is possible to measure, uh, th this might be a lot higher than sort of the tactical, you know, pennies <laughs> that people That's count. right. Um, you know, my impression is that a lot of our unemployment policy or just thinking about unemployment is we would like to avoid it, avoid it from the perspective of an individual. Um, now that would be true even if there were no depreciation, right? You, you're not earning you don't have income, and so you can't uh, pay for you, know, you can't pay your rent, and so forth. Um, and in terms of, so I think just in terms of understanding the size of losses, it's of immense importance, and, and even understanding the distribution of losses across different types of people. Um, in terms of how that would affect, say, optimal policy, it winds up getting very complicated very fast, um, and so a lot of it depends on does depreciation accelerate or decelerate as the length of your unemployment go for longer? Yeah. Um, and, and that kind of interacts with how fast you want to find a new job. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, as the human capital becomes a bigger and bigger part of the value uh, for, a, for, for a company, for an organization, for a country, for an economy, uh, and, and physical capital becomes, you know, less and less important. Um, this has to be really thought through, right? I mean, just we, we, we have a lot of focus on all sorts of accounting aspects around physical capital, which I would argue in 10, 15 years um, doesn't really have much relevance for, for economic That's right. Um, I absolutely agree. And And at this point, we're really stuck in a bit of a measurement challenge, which is just... First off, human capital itself, you know, it could include lots of things that yeah. um, we might disagree of even on what it includes or just things that are unmeasurable. And I think we all kind of all know it's so important and we, we should measure it. We should understand how it changes, say, during recessions and so forth. And it's, it's just of incredible importance to the economy. Um, and I think the more we can do to, to collect, to create, to collect the type of data, I think that could matter for research. It could matter for policy. It could matter for, you know, macroeconomic policy. Yeah, yeah. So in conclusion, Michael, we talked, uh, uh, talked about a few sort of developing country problems, Dominican Republic, Kenya, and, and elsewhere. Um, what, what would you say looking forward, uh, one area that from a policy perspective um, that developing countries could, you know, could really focus on and, and make, a, make an improvement. Yeah, so um, I've more, most recently been really thinking about the education sector that we talked about a little while ago. And um, I think yeah. I, for developing countries that are, you know, develop, that are um, expanding these sectors pretty fast right now, they have the flexibility to maybe be creative, to try out different things, to think of different school models might make sense for different types of students, to think about how much pi public and private provision to balance. Maybe even they have versions of what we have in the US of charter schools. And so I think it's, it's um, 
you know, they have initial conditions, but they're also in the process of changing a lot such that I think they have more flexibility than you see in lots of other countries, but they can learn from the experience of lots of other countries. And so, um, you know, I think that these, uh, basically the how, uh, sectoral distribution of education um, provision, as well as even within sector, does it make sense to have different types of schools? What are the incentives that different schools should have? Um, I think that uh, a lot of developing countries are thinking about this right now. And, um, and I'm really excited to see kind of where they come down, what we can learn from what they're doing and, and what sort of policy we can suggest now and continue to do so. Yeah, it all comes down to education. If you don't get that right, um, everything else that you do may not, may not really work right. out. Right, and, and not just for efficiency reasons, but also, um, you know, equity, and you can really, uh, you can have kind of uh, growth that everyone shares, and especially through education policy. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, thanks so Great. much for I spending really enjoyed time the conversation you, as well. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.